Caroline invited me to edit this issue on the theme of philanthropy and power. Um, looking back on how it's come out, I think um, it's probably uh, fair to say for a global magazine on philanthropy that, that I, I've only really looked at it from the issue of uh, North and West in its outlook, um, which probably doesn't make uh, matter too much today. Um, and it's really written from the tradition of a foundation rather than a, a broader perspective of, 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 uh, of philanthropy. Um, we covered, I think, two basic areas. Um, the, the greater number of articles are, are focused on practical examples of how people are experimenting with the issue of, of if you like, power sharing or, or in involving and engaging people in decision-making processes um, and trying to break down kind of the power relationship between those that have resources and those seeking them. Um, and Sophie in particular has written a great uh, overview of what's going on as well as talking about the exciting new developments in the EDGE fund. Um, and the second kind of area was really to try and think a bit more about the issue of power and money and what this means for philanthropy. Um, I think it's an issue that in one way underlines most of our discussions within the philanthropic community. Uh, it's kind of there all the time, but it's also an issue that we very, very rarely actually discuss uh, as, as an issue. And so what I thought that I'd like to do this morning is just to really talk about three themes that I touched on uh, on my overview, which um, I know that Andrew has really appreciated and I'm sure will want to come back on in, uh, la la later on. Um, so the first of those themes is, is really talking from, a, from the personal, in a way, to the institutional. And I opened the article by saying that six months after I first was appointed to the Joseph Browntree Charitable Trust, a really good friend of mine said, you've changed. And the way they said I changed was that they said, you expect to be listened to. <laughs> and it was a very good reminder for me, I think, of what um, actually working for an institution that does have power does. Um, you know, the honest relationship issue uh, uh, immediately becomes a problem. Some, I think there's been someone who's just recently talked about how you have the last honest conversation with people. Um, uh, because that relationship of power is there, and I think we, need, we really do uh, need to acknowledge that and to try and be very sensitive about it. Um, and, um, you know, I was always trying to be very conscious that when I was meeting grant applicants, um, that possibly someone's job was at risk in, 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 this, in this discussion. And so I think we have to be very sensitive about, about that power with, uh, and, and conscious of the power that we have. One of the things that I wanted to do in this edition was to have the voice of those seeking funds. And in fact, two of the articles, um, one from Liberty and one from the Tax Justice Network, Richard Murphy, uh, are there stating, in a sense, issues from, 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 from the sort of grant seekers world. But I think it's very interesting that I've had many, many a discussion with Shami Chakrabarti, the director of Liberty, about this issue of relationships <coughs> with, with, with grant uh, makers and people that she is trying to get money from. Um, but when it came to her putting something down in writing, um, it was a very much more moderated discussion. <laughs> and when I went back to her and said, well, Shami, what about this that you said to me? Or what about this? She said, I have got three major grant applications in at the moment, mm -hmm. and I need to be very careful. So I think if we don't acknowledge that there is a huge issue here about honesty and open communications and power relationships, then we're, we're not being real. Um, and if that's the case for, for a grant officer, then it's also the case for trustees. And I think the, it, w w w Stephen Bertman, my predecessor at JRCT, and Alison Harker did an interesting study for the Carnegie UK Trust, which <coughs> talked about what were the blocks on people actually doing really adventurous grant making. And the issue was the trustee board. That came out in, in so many of the examples that foundation leaders were saying, we would like to do more adventurous things, but our board won't let us. 
So now that may be moderated, I think, by a study that Diana Lee did later for uh, JRCT and some others, where, where, where it was a more nuanced view about where power lies. Um, but certainly trustee boards have huge power. And I do think there is a big question that comes up. And uh, it was interesting that since I wrote my piece, Pablo Eisenberg has published an article in the Chronicle of Philanthropy in the US where he raises this same issue. You know, I put in my article that there were four trustees of the Gates Foundation. I gave them one too many. There are only three trustees to the Gates Foundation. And the Gates Foundation is making all these decisions which are having a huge impact both in the US and globally. And Pablo Eisenberg says, just take education policy in the US. And he said that uh, the, Glo the, the Gates Foundation has had a huge impact in influencing that policy recently. But it's on a very minor part of policy. And he wouldn't, I don't think, object to what they're trying to achieve. But he said, there's all these other parts of the education system that needs to be reviewed. They're not interested. And it's only on a certain area. So I think we have to think about this issue, about where the boards of foundations can choose where they want to put their resources and can have huge influence. And what does that mean? What does that mean for us if we're really interested in thinking of issues of democracy? So I'm going to have to move on rather quickly to the second point. And I think the second point that I wanted to talk about is the area that, got, that, that, that I found most difficult as I moved towards the end of my career in philanthropy, and that was the issue of philanthropy and inequality. Because many of us would be in philanthropy because we want to make the world a better place. And yet, what was true at the time of Roundtree in uh, endowing his foundation, and what I think is true now, is that there is a, a, a connection. I don't know how you would define it any further than that, but there's a connection between the level of inequality in our societies and philanthropy and the growth of philanthropy. And that is a very difficult thing to actually uh, uh, to, to discuss or to talk about, but it does seem to me to be really important. And if you say, well, is this issue of power and philanthropy important? I would point to The Spirit Level, which was a, a, a book that the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust funded and where it talked about um, the better society, societies which suffer less social problems in all sorts of indicators are the ones which are more equal. And they're more, the, the more equal societies are better for the wealthy as well. And yet we are growing into a world situation where there is more inequality. And so I think the question for philanthropy is, you know, are we being real about thinking, or are we just being uh, about change, or are we really just a sticking plaster um, on, on, on this issue? I mean, it's very interesting in the in 1880s, Joseph Roundtree wrote, charity as ordinarily practiced, the charity of emotion, the charity which takes the place of justice, creates much of the misery that it relieves but does not relieve all the misery that it creates. And that was the same, that he wrote that in 1880, and I think that that's a phrase which maybe we ought to look at about again, because are we really uh, making a huge difference? Or within a democratic society, what is the role of philanthropy in terms of ma 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 making that kind of impact? The third issue that I want to talk about, this is all in the article, by the way, so you can all read about it later. Um, the third issue is, well, what does that mean? What does that mean for us? And I suppose what I want to focus on that area is that um, I've always thought that philanthropy is best placed to tackle the issues that neither the state nor the market is able to tackle. And for me, that means that we ought to be thinking about building an active civil society which can hold the state and the now I would say the markets. I think one of the real problems in the last 10 years is that there's not been an active civil society able to hold the financial markets to account. Uh, but I think those are the areas which I, from my philanthropy, I would be wanting to engage in, to build a civil society 
that understands those kind of tra uh, uh, those issues and can be an a, a ameliorating force on what is going on both in politics and in the markets. And I quote in my article Michael Edwards, who used to be at the Ford Foundation. He wrote in Open Democracy, no great social causes were mobilized through the market in the 20th century. The civil rights movement, the women's movement, the environment movement, the New Deal and the Great Society were all pushed ahead by civil society and anchored in the power as government as a force for the public good. And I would agree with that. I would agree with that, 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 that statement. That it's not that comes out of philanthropy that change happens. It's from actually having an active civil society that can understand the issues and, and, and can push forward, and having a strong and responsive government that can actually then re relate to that. And one of my real problems is that as philanthropy gets stronger, in a sense, the state is getting weaker. And I think we need both. We need strong philanthropy and a strong state to interact with if we are going to really have the kind of change that we perhaps need in this situation. My fear is that in our monetarized society, that those who have money feel that they can determine the agenda. And they have an interest in determining the agenda. And I think this is dangerous. I think it's dangerous in the long run because I think what will happen out of that is that we will lessen the, the, the potential of civil society to actually uh, bring up these new ideas and to be challenging and, and, and all of that. And, you know, one last statement just before I go. In Pablo Eisenberg's article in the Chronicle of Philanthropy in August, he mentions now that 60% of foundations in the United States of America do not accept grant applications from civil society. And that is an, ex an example of the way that I see philanthropy has gone. And it might be sensible for an individual organization to think about that, but I think if we look collectively at what is happening, we find that philanthropy is deciding the agenda. And it is almost instrumentalizing civil society to do what it thinks needs to happen. And that, in my view, is the wrong way around. And we need to try and think of ways of reversing that. So that's just a flavor of um, the issues that are addressed in this issue of uh, Alliance magazine. And I'm now looking forward to having uh, the debate about it. Thank you. Thank you.